Hello everyone, welcome to a new chapter, chapter 21, Blood Vessels and Circulation. So I'm going to begin this as I usually do, a couple of things. First off, for success, attitude is equally as important as ability. If you keep a good attitude throughout the course, um, then it's generally more likely that you're going to be successful. When you start to, uh, I can't do this, uh, this, this is a load of bull, yada, 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 then you tend to kind of do more damage to yourself. So what we're going to do is take a look at this uh, material. As a reminder, if you guys noticed on the first exam, you would have seen that I asked every one of these. So there will be a question where I discuss all those. Usually what that would be is there will be one or two questions that maybe I never would have asked before because of it, like, like maybe shock uh, or checking pulse or blood pressure. Uh, but the rest of those things I always would test on anyway. So uh, it just kind of usually forces me to ask a couple questions I normally wouldn't have put, but that's just, uh, as we look at that, that is a big thing uh, that the uh, course curriculum says to do. So that's how I strive to do my exams. Now, what we're going to get started with is the different types of blood vessels. And as we do that, one of the things I forgot to do here is on my hover cam, let's... Get that hover cam locked and ready. And what we're going to do is discuss the four different types of blood vessels. And as we discuss these four types of blood vessels, what I want to do here is to get in and discuss them and describe them and relate them as to how they deal with the heart. And I'm going to have red. I'm going to have pink. I'm going to have purple. I'm going to have... Um, light blue and a dark blue and I'm going to use those colors here uh, to sketch this out from red, pink, purple, light blue and darker blue. I'm going to use these colors to sketch this out so if you want to join in with me and have any of those colors on hand feel free to do so. So we're going to start with our heart and just in case you couldn't tell this is a heart and we're going to take all that. Let me autofocus lock that one more time. Hopefully there we go. So our heart, we have blood leaving the heart and blood coming to the heart that we should know. Um, now this is not referencing the atria or things like that. So all I'm doing is uh, the relative direction of blood flow to the heart or away from the heart. Um, for the venous system and arterial systems. So we're going to start off with a very large vessel here that would take blood out. And as blood leaves the heart, remember we're coming out of arteries. Arteries always away from the heart. So the arteries come away from the heart. Smaller vessels will come off of our arteries here. Um, called arterioles and the arterioles uh, which we'll describe more in detail in just a moment will come off then I'm going to use purple and I'm going to go into some vessels that come off of that um, they are very extensive vessels um, extremely branched extremely um, uh, expanded outwards and these will be the capillaries and then as we come from capillaries we're going to come into our light blue here and we're going to leave that and we're going to see we're going to go into venules and the venules will go to the veins so if blood were to travel through that of course uh, we would see that arteries always carry blood away from the heart veins always carry blood to the heart okay uh, and that was something we talked about in our lab as well so we want to make sure you guys have that as you go through that as a reminder where we're starting. So as we start off, we want our mind. Now, what are your arteries? Arteries always away from the heart. Uh, carry blood away from the heart. Arterioles are branches, very small branches off your arteries. 
Capillaries are very small vessels. They are the exchange vessels. They are the only place that any kind of exchange happens. Uh, diffusion between um, the blood's nutrient and interstitial fluid. And um, what I always kind of wish I'd done here is, oh, that should be a, a number, then that should be, boop. Uh, like that and I always seem to forget as I write my notes to kind of do things like that but it's, uh, it's usually my fault and I'm just going to very quickly tweak that up a little bit uh, so let me pause real fast okay sorry about that I just want to make sure that I did that because if I don't I'll forget there's always little minor edits I want to make I always forget them, so I figure I'd go ahead and do it now. Uh, so what I wanted you guys to see is these are the exchange vessels. This is so small that exchange can happen. We're going to talk more about that. Venules are the small veins. They unite to form the bigger veins. The veins go towards the heart, bring blood to the heart. Now, as we walk through that, let's look and take a blood vessel. If I were to take one of these arteries and veins we drew and sectioned it, what might I see in a blood vessel is there are going to be three walls to a blood vessel. Three parts of the blood vessel wall. All blood vessels have these things in them to some degree except for the very small capillaries. So if I were to cut one open, one of the things we're going to do, let's just use, um, let's start out with um, uh, red, blue, and green. Okay, so Let's go out here and draw a circle in red, and this is going to reference the outermost wall of a blood vessel, and this is going to be the tunica externa. And the tunica externa, that is the connective tissue layer. Okay. Now, that could be a variety of thickness that it has. Then let's just say there is another layer inside of here called the tunica media that is smooth muscle. And then uh, lining the innermost will be a simple squamous called the tunica Intima, which is the endothelium or simple squamous. Simple squamous. Okay. Now, so what happens here is your um, uh, intima here, that's all your muscle tissues here. Say we have all of our muscle tissues. I'm just going to kind of uh, fill this in, the smooth muscle, okay? So this is all smooth muscle tissues here. This outer connective tissue layer could be very dense, uh, thick, or it could not be as thick. It really depends upon the tissue type. So we're going to kind of shade that in, okay? It could be a little bit more. So one of the things I'm going to want you guys to know is what tissue composes each of the different three tunics. Uh, and have an idea of the structure of that. Now, something I'm going to label here, because uh, you'll need it later, is called the lumen. Lumen is the opening here that light can go through, like you illuminate. Okay. And I'm going to have that, and it's something we're going to need in just a minute. Now, for example, so the tunica media, or uh, the tunica intima, or interna, uh, here I think I have tunica interna, uh, or intima, I have intima that I drew, the innermost. Uh, this is your endothelium. And what I'm going to kind of do here is I always, uh, sorry, if I don't do that, I will forget. And there's these little minor things I've been wanting to do to the notes for some time as I typed them and, and space it down a little better. So the endothelial lining, the simple squamous, is that innermost lining. It is an endothelium called the tunica intima or tunica interna, uh, this is a uh, uh, name for that. Now, the uh, tunica media is the middle layer. Media, middle, muscular, smooth muscle. 
This is what makes your blood vessels get smaller or larger, constriction or dilate. Now, anytime it, these muscles, the tunica media, contract, the muscle cells, the blood vessels diameter shrinks. The inside, the lumen, gets smaller. If it is relaxed, the lumen gets bigger. So contraction, the vessel diameter decreases. Relaxed, it gets bigger. Now, the outermost is tunica externa. Some people might refer to this as an adventitia, uh, but the outermost layer of connective tissues here, um, that would be your outer tunic, tunica externa. And anytime this wall, these three layers have a weakening, there's a bulge called an aneurysm and that can pop and that bulging outwards is caused by an increased blood vessel and you can rupture this aneurysm. So you could be born with a defect to the vessel wall, to the media, the intima or externa to create a weakness here, okay? Now, the vessel walls, if you look at differences in arteries and veins, if I were to slice open an artery, what you're going to see is arteries are much thicker walled. I mean, you look at the artery here on the left, you can see it's got a much thicker tunica media and a little bit thicker tunica externa. Uh, there's more muscle. In the vessel lumen, the hollow area inside, you're going to see that the arteries have a very more rounded lumen, rounded lumen here, compared to a more collapsed lumen of a vein. The endothelium of an artery is highly uh, uh, highly folded in a, uh, we say that way, because it can't contract, so it needs to be folded. So when the artery bulges out and comes back in, as it's out, those little folds can push outwards but it comes back in and it's wrinkled to allow that elastic recoil with uh, pulse. Now the valves, veins have valves. Vein ha veins have valves. Veins have valves and that prevents a backflow of blood downwards. There is also different pressures. Arteries are very high pressured where veins are lower pressure. Okay, let me, uh, one second. All right, so. Uh, what I, you may notice, I did a very quick edit here. Now, vasoconstriction, what is that? That's when the smooth muscle contracts and it makes it harder for blood to get through. If you have a small diameter, it is harder for things to pass through. Versus a large diameter, it's easy for things to go through. So anytime vasoconstriction happens, this increases your blood pressure. Pressures are going to be higher inside there but blood loss and blood movement is more difficult. Vasodilation, a very big blood vessel, blood is easy because it relaxes, smooth muscle relaxes, a bigger diameter increases that blood flow. The amount of blood go through it is much higher, but that decreases the blood pressure. So fluid loss could actually be increased here, or at least fluid movement would be increased. The amount of blood flow increases uh, with a vasodilation and fluid loss could be increased with that, especially with an injury. Okay. Now there are arteries out there. Now one of the things I will use in the description is the diameter and using. Uh, I will use a diameter as part of the description, not the entirely of the thing. But I'd want you guys to roughly know its diameter. Okay. I'm, I might come in and ask you. Part of your description of these will include a diameter. Elastic arteries, or we call them conducting arteries, they're very big. They're about 2.5 centimeters. Now, if you don't know what 2.5 centimeters is, um, here I have a uh, um, here I have a particular. Um, <clears throat> uh, here we go, centimeters, and you're talking about here is 2.5 right here. So about this big in diameter is what we're looking at between my finger and this finger here. Okay. Now, uh, or an inch, uh, roughly an inch. Now, it takes large volumes. It conducts large amounts of blood, like your aorta. Your aorta does not really supply blood to any parts of the body. Think of the aorta as like the water main out in the, out in the road. It carries a lot of water. Then you go off that aorta to larger pipes that go up to your house. Then from the larger pipes, you go into your house and you have smaller pipes throughout your house. Then hoses that might connect from pipes to the sink so you can get water at low pressure out. 
And this is kind of what happens with your blood vessels. You don't drink from the water main. You don't get blood directly from the aorta. Aorta brings a lot of blood. Your pulmonary trunk is also a very large elastic artery. Now, so there's a lot of elastic fibers and not very much smooth muscle there. So when the pressure's inside, during a ventricular systole, blood pressure does go up and that causes it to push out. And when the blood pressure's dropped during diastole, it snaps back. So they're very snappy. They are like this guy here. Okay, very stretchy, very elastic. Now, muscular arteries, these are distribution arteries. These are like the small pipes in your house. They're medium size, about four millimeters or a sixteenth of an inch. Four millimeters, well, these little lines on here is a millimeter. One, two, three, four. So about that space would be a typical diameter of a muscular artery, okay? They have a lot of smooth muscle, uh, a lot more, like your brachial, femoral, and radial arteries uh, are around that size, they're in your medium. Now you have smaller ones, like arterioles. Arterioles, we call them resistance vessels. Now, we said that blood vessels have a wall called a tunica media. Well, arterioles don't really have a very well-defined tunica media. They have smooth muscle, but basically it's not very well-defined. There's lots of gaps okay, that would be found there. And the vessels do change their diameter very strongly. The nervous system, the autonomic nervous system really make these guys spasm and open up. Uh, so your sympathetic and parasympathetic Sympathetic nervous system really strong to make them do that, for example. This is what happens when people get conditions like Raynaud's, where they have what's called a neurogenic vascular spasm. Now, uh, these blood vessels, they get smaller, uh, the resistance goes up. Think about a straw here. If I had a straw, and my straw, my drink, if it was a very, is a big straw, it's fairly easy to get liquid through that. But if I add a very small straw, it's harder to get liquid through it. There's a lot more resistance. So uh, the diameter of a vessel determines resistance. So these are smaller and they can even spasm down strongly to increase resistance uh, in an area. Now then there's capillaries. Capillaries are exchange vessels. There's no other place where, cap, uh, where blood uh, can actually exchange to what's called interstitium. Um, let me kind of explain what that is a little bit, what interstitial fluids are. Um, something I want to talk about here. And uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw what's well, supposed to be a capillary. Keep this handy because we're going to come back at it in a minute. Uh, we'll use this drawing later on. And then down here I'm just going to draw a blob. And this is this blob is the tissues of the body. Here we have a capillary, and a fluid that we have between here is called the interstitial fluid. Okay, that is the fluids located between capillaries and the tissues we want to supply. It is an exchange fluid, a fluid, a type of extracellular fluid surrounding tissues. Okay, called the interstitial fluid. This is what accumulates in people who have like uh, the edema. Uh, the edema fluid, like during congestive heart failure, will accumulate, and this will start coming out of the skin through the pores. Is interstitial fluid, and interstitium accumulates. Now, uh, what you're going to notice is is that these blood vessels. Uh, there are con uh, types of them. There's continuous, the most common, where there are no gaps. The endothelium is complete. So it only allows like water and very small ions and some a small number of solutes and lipid soluble stuff to go through, but no plasma proteins can go through. No proteins can pass through. Now if you're fenestrated, what is the word fenestra? Fenestra means window. Windows. It's fenestrated. If you were to defenestrate someone, you throw them out the window. So that is a windowed capillary. They have fenestrations or pores in them. 
and they allow larger molecules like some proteins. So they are found in endocrine glands. They're found uh, in the kidneys and they're in the brain. Brain, endocrine, and kidneys. Now there's some other types depending on what's going on. There's They have pores, little holes. There's another one that has big gaps called sinusoids where there are big gaps left where there are big gaping holes. These are found in the liver. The liver produces a tremendous amount of protein to the blood. Remember, the liver produces by far the majority of plasma proteins. And of that, uh, it needs to put a lot of protein out. The spleen is a site of the uh, red blood cell uh, um, breakdown. So you've got to get the globulins that you've recycled and get them in bone marrow, same thing. You're recycling blood vessels and endocrine organs that have to produce very large proteins. So they're there to allow the blood and the interstitial free fluid movement. Very free and easy exchange of fluid. So here we have a lot of phagocytes because it's so easy to get things in. And you would probably be, you'll be seeing that. Why it can be so easy in these areas for pathogens to sneak in. Why we need those and what might be going on with certain diseases. Um, why these are good issue, why these are important issues to learn. You guys will be noticing that liver, spleen, bone marrow, and endocrine glands, these guys have easy access. We need lots of phagocytes present. Okay. Now, as you can see, your continuous capillaries have no gap. Fenestrated capillaries have pores. Sinusoidals have very big gaps between their endothelial cells. And that's going to allow free exchange. Okay. Now, Capillary beds. What happens is, is capillaries organize themselves into capillary beds. The capillary beds or a plexus. A couple of, you guys ever hear of a vascular plexus? For example, you might have learned of hypodermal plexus. That's a series of capillary beds. Um, now, each capillary bed has what is called a precapillary sphincter. That is a muscle that wraps around parts of the capillary to reduce blood flow to that area. Closes it off. You can close off all of it and only allow it to go straight through a thoroughfare, prevent these other vessels here to, uh, to have that happen. So that this capillary here can shunt off and if need be, close it off and just go in without going through a capillary bed at all. So let's say this is my skin and it's very cold and my skin, I don't want to put blood to my skin to get it cold. So I will shunt blood away from the skin and send it straight on out. This is why you get pale is these are shutting down. Why people with Raynaud's when these have these vascular spasms that are very intense, they will turn pale. It's because these uh, sphincters and things like that, these blood vessels are spasming down, the smooth muscles are spasming down, preventing blood flow. Uh, this is why the skin turns white, uh, characteristic of somebody with Raynaud's disease, uh, Raynaud's syndrome. Now, so those thoroughfare channels, that's just the area, direct connection between them. So if, let's say we didn't want it to go to these areas to exchange nutrients. We just wanted to go straight on through. That's what that is. Now. There's different pressures in a body. Now, what I'm going to do is, is on this guy, I'm going to do some drawings here in a minute. And there is uh, uh, what we refer to as blood pressure ranges from about 35 to 100 in your aorta. So that means capillary hydrostatic pressures go between 18 to 35. Okay, now, what I want to do is over here, I'm going to put about, uh, uh, I'm going to put here, blood coming in, arterial end, 35 millimeters of mercury, venial end, about 18 millimeters of mercury. That will be useful to know. I won't directly test on it, I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to use this 35 to 18 range on both ends of this capillary bed. Okay. Now, what happens is your venous pressure is around 18. Low end of arterial pressure is about 35. 
Now, the circulatory pressure is basically, what is the pressure across all the cardiovascular system? And that's a very different thing, okay? So we have, like, the pressures across all of it, and that varies. But the blood pressure is the arterial pressure. Those are equivalent terms. Capillary is hydrostatic pressure, or CHP, ranges from 18 to 35. 8 to 35 at the arterial end, th uh, 18 at the venous end, or venial end. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Because veins are very low pressure, and they collect blood from your tissues to go to the heart, they have to get blood from the capillary beds. Now, because veins are very big, and they have low pressures, they can't overcome gravity. So what they do is they need two things to help them. They need valves, veins have valves, and then they use muscle compressions. So the muscle compressions here, when the calf muscles, we actually refer to this calf muscle here as the second heart. Because as it squeezes and closes off the bottom valve and opens the top valve, it helps to constantly move blood up the leg. And we call this our second heart, this muscular pump here. We actually, that's what we refer to this muscular compression in the leg is second heart. And you may have noticed that somebody has passed out, maybe when they're um, uh, standing and their legs are locked, they might pass out because blood starts to pull. They don't have this help. The compressions push the blood up towards the heart through the one way valves and you squeeze it up and the one way valve closes and it can't go back down and your muscles keep helping it go up, 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 up to pre help prevent that backflow. And like people, let's say you're in a fighter plane and you're pulling those G-forces, they have a, a, a suit, the flight suit blows up balloons in your body, inflatable air sacs, to squeeze the blood back up, preventing you from passing out. Now another way we can assist blood flow is called a respiratory pump. There is, upon inhalation and exhalation, the pressures in the chest, thoracic cavity, change. When I inhale, my thoracic cavity expands to make me inhale, but that makes the pressures inside the chest less. Air enters the lungs, but this reduced pressure makes it easier to get blood into the vena cava and right atrium, especially the inferior vena cava and the right atrium. It's easier to get blood up there, okay? We exhale, cavity, chest cavity, thoracic cavity gets smaller and the pressures go up. This forces blood into the right atrium. So breathing in and out, you're going to see, helps to try to increase venous return. And this increase in venous return can cause an increase in cardiac output. And this is why you get a paradoxal pulse, pulses paradoxus, where there is uh, your decrease in your systolic pressure during an inhale. Is blood has been going in upon an inhale, blood is being put into the atrium, and before that, your pressures drop systemically. It's called pulses paradoxus. It's why when you inhale, there's an abnormally large decrease in systolic pressure during that. Okay. Now, uh, you're not going to see that on the test, by the way. It's not going to be on the test, pulses paradoxus. Just going to talk about it. Now, heart rate. Uh, what is that? Heart rate, heart's beating faster. If it goes up, your blood pressure goes up. Okay. We're going to see factors that influence blood pressure. Heart rate, the faster the heart beats, the more times that blood surging through the vessel, the more times it pushes against the vessel wall. Now, so what is it that affects your blood pressure? Well, heart rate. Increased heart rate, higher blood pressure, more blood surging through the vessels more frequently. The amount of blood, the viscosity of blood, and resistance. So heart rate, how fast? Blood volume, how much blood? If you have more blood in your vessels, you have a greater blood pressure. Okay, what happens is, for example, more blood arrives to your heart, heart, cardiac output goes up, more blood out. You're going to increase heart pressure that way. But also what you're going to do is you're going to have more volume, more stretching of the vessels. So kind of a double whammy. So having a high volume of pressure tends to try to make the heart work harder. And that gets into a problem called cardiac hypertrophy. 
Now, viscosity, if blood gets thick, for example, in a diabetic, diabetes mellitus, the blood gets sticky and thick and viscous like maple syrup, and it's going to go through very slow. So aspirin can lower viscosity, lower pressure. So what you're going to see is, and I know I need to do that, and I, I'm going to move that down on this, is uh, pressure, if it's more resistant to flow, it's thicker, it flows less easily, increasing blood pressure. Remember, blood normally is five times thicker than water. You put sugar in that and it gets even more sticky, and that is one of the problems. Diabetics uh, constantly will have to fight high blood pressure and hypertension. Then there's resistance. The higher the blood pressure, the higher, or higher the resistance. Resistance is how hard uh, you, the blood has to fight to get through the vessel. If the vessel's squeezing down the blood vessel and he's like, I can't get through. Or if the blood vessel's lining is all messed up because of a blood clot or a, a plaque buildup, it's going to be hard for the blood to get through. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, okay? So resistance, vascular resistance is a normal thing. Vascular resistance is something that just exists. Because blood is flowing. I want you to think with vascular resistance that you're trying to go down the hallway in, the, in on campus. You guys walk down the hallway. Now, if you're going down the hallway at, let's say, 5 o'clock, 5.30 p.m. for a class, hardly anybody's in the hallway. If you try to go down the hallways at 9 a.m., it's like a human car wash in the hall. It's tight. Everybody's packed in there. And it's very hard to get through the halls. But, same hallway, less people in it, easier to get through. So what we're going to see is, is there's always going to be a resistance the blood vessel walls have because blood cells, blood is frictioning against the cell wall, blood vessel wall, and it's like, ah, I'm, I'm going through there, but lots of things increase the resistance. Now, vascular length, vessel length. The longer the blood vessel, the more chance it has to get resistant. If it has to go for a longer time, basically what pressure is, is flow, uh, flow and resistance. Resistance to flow. Flow over resistance, we might say. So, when the flow over resistance is affected here, um, you have, so basically like, uh, the longer you have to go, the more you're going to rub against the blood vessel wall, the more you're going to experience vascular resistance. Vessel diameter, a very big vessel, blood in the middle is going to, there's more blood that can get through that. It's less likely, more blood, uh, less blood would be bumping against the blood vessel wall. If it's smaller, more blood is bumping against the vessel wall, and it's harder to get through. Turbulence, if the blood vessels have a texture due to, let's say, a plaque deposit, blood will swirl, and that will make it increased pressure, the surface texture. That also could be a damage, a, a buildup of calcium deposit, plaque deposit through like uh, cholesterol deposits, things like that, uh, cardiovascular disease. Okay, So these kinds of things all affect resistance. Now I do want to mention what checking blood pressure is. I'm going to describe how it happens. So basically what we do, we take a brachial artery like the one we saw in lab, and what you're going to do is you're going to take a cuff, you're going to put this cuff around the brachial artery, you're going to take it, inflate this cuff, and it's going to squeeze the brachial artery down. And it's no pulse sounds can be heard, you might put it up there to close to 200 millimeters of mercury. It's completely cut off. There is no flow in that. Now we let the cuff loose and it starts to relax. And normally about 120 millimeters of mercury you're going to start hearing Kortikoff sounds. The little sounds called Kortikoff sounds will start. And they'll keep going and keep going and keep going. So when the sounds start you mark that as systolic pressure. Then they, when they stop, you mark that as diastolic pressure, is when the Kortikoff sounds stop. Okay, so we might go around. Normally, you're going to uh, inflate the cuff. Uh, what they're going to teach you guys in uh, patient care and assessment is 180, uh, 180 millimeters of mercury is 
where you're going to inflate to. Three millimeters a second coming off. Wait to the quarter cough sound start. You the first knocking that's the systolic. When the knocking stops, that's the diastolic. 120 over 80 is the normal pressure for a human being. Now, when I was a student, it was 120 over 70. We've increased it by 10 millimeters of mercury. Now, when pressures pulse, the arterial pressures, they go up, they go down. They go up with systole, down with diastole. In any vessel, they go up, they go down. They go up, they go down. When the arterial pressure rises with a ventricular systole, that's systolic pressure, uh, typically around 120 millimeters of mercury. Now, you might see it actually higher in very small vessels. And so we use something like a muscular artery that is right around that 120 mil, uh, millimeter mark. And then it drops down to 80. And then we want to uh, look at 120 over 80. This is because there is a rhythmic pulse, it goes up and down, up and down. You can feel in the neck or the wrist a rhythmic pulse where the arteries pulsate. Okay? Now, this is another calculation you're going to need to be able to do for this exam. We're going to practice some of these right now, is mean arterial pressure. So, mean arterial pressure or MAP. So you need two things. What is mean arterial pressure? Mean arterial pressure is diastolic pressure plus pulse pressure divided by three. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Mean arterial pressure is pulse pressure divided by three plus, oh, sorry. Mean arterial pressure is your diastolic pressure plus Pulse pressure divided by 3. So you're wondering what is pulse pressure? Well, pulse pressure is your systolic pressure minus the diastolic pressure. So pulse pressure, let's say 120. Uh, if BP, let's say we had a BP of 120 over 80. Pulse pressure would be 120 minus 80. Now, what Mr. Leffer is going to do is he's going to get his good old handy dandy calculator out because I do not feel like uh, being able to do the math right now. I am brain dead. But uh, what you're going to do is you're going to get pulse pressure equals 40. Okay? Now, that 40 pulse pressure. Now, what do we do? Well, we have our diastolic pressure. So, mean arterial pressure now. We're going to take our diastolic pressure that we have here, 80 plus 40 divided by 3. Okay. Now, as you can see, diastolic pressure plus pulse pressure divided by 3. What you're going to do here is, remember, uh, you might remember, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally or PEMDAS. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally or PEMDAS. Parentheses first. So what we're going to do is 40 divided by 3. And that is about 13.33. And I'm going to cut it off at, the near, uh, at that number. Plus 80. Okay, so now we're doing that plus 80. And so mean arterial pressure equals 93.33, okay, on that particular problem. Okay, so uh, what we will see in that is millimeters of mercury. So you need to remember that pulp memorize pulse pr mean arterial pressure is diastolic pressure plus Pulse pressure divided by three. Now, if you're already working in healthcare and have to memorize this equation and you did another one, there are some variations of this equation out there. Uh, case in point, um, uh, art, uh, arterial pressure equation. There are some different variations out there. 
that you may use. Here we have uh, that equation. Same thing. It's roughly should be the same thing. It's uh, so if you guys get that uh, the uh, um, uh, same thing. So you're welcome to use that one too if you already memorized one. Uh, I'm not going to have a task question that says what is the equation, but I'm going to give you a patient's blood pressure and ask you find mean arterial pressure. So what we have here is some practice calculations. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is, I'm so sorry that I logged in to my uh, Google account. Okay, so I'm going to solve some of these problems. So, first set of problems is BP equals 120 over 80. Well, we've done that one. Okay, so that was not there. We've been done. So let's skip to another one. Let's do 130 over 84. Okay, now, mean arterial pressure, remember, is diastolic pressure plus pulse pressure divided by 3. So we first have to find the pulse pressure. So 130 minus 84. 130 minus 84, so 54 divided by 3. And so uh, here, 130 minus 84, 46. Sorry. I'm so sorry. That was my fault. <laughs> That's what I, I am extremely, I mean, I'm in, I, I've been in class all uh, 46 over 3. Okay, so we got that. So now what we're doing, mean arterial pressure is, so diastolic pressure is 84 plus, then 46 divided by 3 now. Now we got 46 divided by 3. That's about 15.33. So now 84 plus that. And that's 99.33. So mean arterial pressure. So what I'm going to do is have you guys calculate the next two on your own. I walked you through two of them. Make sure you can calculate these. It is something I will have you practice. I will let you use a calculator uh, provided it is not your cell phone on this exam. Uh, one of the reasons is, is I had to at this exact moment because honestly what I'm trying to teach and pretty exhausted. It's been a long day for me. I'll, I'll tend to forget things. I won't be able to do both of these at the same time and have come back and taught and graded and everything and then do that. So, all right, be able to do these, okay? So there will be uh, at least one question of that. Okay, now, this is something I'm going to draw out. Something that we I want to help you guys understand. I'm going to come back and take this drawing here that we've done. And I'm going to explain this, and I'm going to draw it first and teach it this way. Then I'm going to come back, and we're going to talk about it. So we're going to take this drawing we've done. And I've got to remove this little dealy whopper there. Let's put him over there. Okay, so what we got here. Now, this is a tail of two pressures. Tail of two pressures. Tail of two forces. Okay? What is our two forces? Well, we have inside of capillaries, these values here represent the capillary hydrostatic pressure capillary hydrostatic pressure CHP now out here there's a pressure called blood colloidal osmotic pressure blood colloidal osmotic pressure BCOP and CHIP so you got your BCOP and your California Highway Patrol your CHP Okay, so what we've got here is fluid follows force, and you got three forces. Here it's at 35, over here it's at 18. I'm not going to worry about the force here in the midstream. So now, what you might be thinking, what's blood colloidal osmotic pressure? Well, plasma, remember, has a protein called albumin in it. And albumin is the primary cause of blood's colloidal osmotic pressure. 
So if you have an osmotic pressure, that is the concentration gradient inside draws water towards itself. Now, the other force is capillaries hydrostatic pressure. And these two forces are in opposition to each other. They are opposite forces going against each other. Which fluid, which force wins? The stronger force. Remember, fluid follows force. Fluid follows force. Fluid follows force. Okay, so what's going to happen is here it's about 35 millimeters of mercury. So the capillary hydrostatic pressures are great. So very high. And because they're so great, water will move and leave and go out to the interstitial fluid, taking whatever is dissolved in it, whatever nutrients. Okay? Now, once it gets all this volume is lost, the pressures drop down considerably. The volume, we've lost water, pressures drop. So now these things are equal. So water neither moves in or out with any net movement. It just moves in and out. But what does happen is gases exchange. CO2 and O2, CO2 and O2 exchange in this, okay? Midstream in a capillary bed, that's going to happen. Now, when we get to the very end, the pressures have dropped, but albumin is still there. So what's going to happen is any water here is going to move in. Why? Because the blood colloidal osmotic pressure now is so great, fluid follows the force inward. Okay? So what happens, and one of the things I'm going to ask you guys on a test, is what's going to happen when capillary hydrostatic pressure is greater than blood colloidal osmotic pressure, when the two are equal, or when blood colloidal osmotic pressure is greater than os uh, capillary hydrostatic pressure? So be we're prepared to answer a question on this. This is one question on the test right here in this drawing. And if you can do this now, why am I teaching you this? Well, let's say we have a patient who is hypertensive. That will increase the capillary hydrostatic pressure, which will reduce the amount of water reuptake. Now here, this water is pushed out. This is called filtration. Here, this is called Yes. Hold on one second, guys. Okay, sorry. I got uh, uh, a student came to my office here, so reabsorption. Reabsorption is when water goes back in. And that goes into the venous system. So whatever's in that water gets picked up. So let's say there were hormones. That's going to get picked up. Let's say there were waste products. That's going to get picked up. Let's say here... This tissue needs a hormone delivered or a nutrient delivered. Here we need a gas exchange. So usually, like in the lungs, we want a huge amount of the capillary bed to be involved in gas exchange. So we have very low pressures. If you have exceedingly high pressures, very high pressures will constantly cause an increase in this interstitial fluid and it will increase causing edema and swelling. This is why people's feet and legs swell when they have uh, hypertension. All right, so be able to draw this out. Uh, it's going to really help you understand it better, but there is a test question on that. Uh, there is definitely going to be one question there. And uh, what I am, uh, as you can see here, you can actually see the capillary hydrostatic pressures being produced by all the proteins, especially albumin. Uh, being produced in the solutes, creating the creating the uh, hydrostatic pressures uh, is being produced there because of that. Fluids want to go in, uh, but they're being opposed by the capillary hydrostatic pressures. And if these two pressures can be uh, 
met and be opposed, then we can move things. And that's what causes filtration or reabsorption. Do not worry about the values, but do know when filtration will happen, when reabsorption will happen. Okay? Uh, and guys, I am going to end it here for the first lecture. There will be a second part. I will be mostly about regulation of blood pressure and things like that. Uh, that's the other second big part. But guys, thank you so much for watching. And this is a great time to stop. Thank you. Let me upload as soon as I can see my...